The uh, title of the message this morning is, uh, The World Tries to Compete with God. The World Tries to Compete with God. There was a Sunday school teacher, and those of you who are Sunday school teachers, and especially those of you that have had smaller children, you know what it's all about. And for some reason, with most Sunday school classes, there's usually one little boy in there who misbehaves, and he's hard to deal with. And you have to work with, every once in a while it's a girl, but most of the time it's a boy. But there was this one Sunday school teacher, and she had a little boy in her class, and he was just misbehaving. And she tried everything in the world that she could. She tried to give him rewards. She tried everything else she could think of. She didn't know what in the world she was going to do with him to keep him from misbehaving. And so one day, at her wit's end, she looked at him and she said, Johnny, I'm really very much afraid that I'm not going to see you in heaven. And Johnny said, Gee, that's too bad. What have you been doing? <laughs> I think sometimes with sin, that's the way we all look at it. It's everybody else's sin and not our own, huh? But the world tries to compete with us. To, uh, it tries to compete with God uh, for our love. And that always leads to sins and everything else. John, uh, John calls us to love God and to love our neighbor. And then in our text today, he warns us about the world. The world. He warns us that the world is in competition with God. And the world and the things of the world are what, the, what Satan uses to try to tempt us and to lead us away from God. You see, Satan is the prince of this world for now. And we say for now because in the gospel uh, of John, Jesus said, now is the time of judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And so the cross began the driving out of Satan of this world. And we understand that. But still he is here and still he is the present prince of this world. And he constantly works against the cross of Christ and the work of Christ. But the work of cro the cross and the work of Christ is what's going to be the end of Satan. <clears throat> Satan uses everything he can, everything he can find, to try to keep the people away from God. And he tries to lead those who are close to God away. And that's why John writes these words of warning to us. So let's read. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. The world, it competes for our love. For our love. And in this, in this passage of Scripture, John warns who? He warns Christians. Those, that's who he wrote it to. This is not written to pagan people. It's written to us. And it's written as a warning. A warning about the world and the love of the world. And not only the world, but everything in it. Everything in it. Jesus himself warned us in the Gospels, you can't have it both ways. You can't have the love of God and the love of the world at the same time. You can't be in love with both of them. Because you see, they're opposed to one another. When Jesus was talking about our love of money in, in Luke chapter 16, verse 13, he said this, No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Now that's what he said first. Then he added this. You cannot serve both God and money. So Jesus did what first? He gave us the general rule. The general rule 
is you can't have one foot in heaven and one foot on the earth or one foot in perdition. You can't have both. The general rule, you can't serve two masters. And you can't love them both, especially when they clash with one another so completely. And then Jesus gives us the specific. We can't seek the riches of this world and the riches of God or the riches that God gives us at the same time. You can't pursue them both. It's impossible. You can't do it. We either set our hearts on the things above or we set our hearts on the things below. We can't have it both ways. My daddy used to tell me, he said, son, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And I had no idea what he was talking about at first. And it took a few years before I ever really realized what he meant. But the point was, is that I always thought, well, daddy, why can't I have my cake and eat it too? That was my first argument. I wanted to do both. I mean, after all, cake is cake. At least give me a slice of it. You know, we'll save the rest of it maybe. But later on, my brain started working. I realized he wasn't talking about cake at all. He was talking about life. He was talking about my life. And he was talking about decisions that I was making in my life. He says, son, you can't have it both ways. You can't do it. There was a clash. And they did. And that's what John is telling us, the same thing. Listen, you just can't have it both ways. You can't. Because the world and God, they clash. You know, in, in my years in the ministry, I've been greatly saddened. And I mean greatly saddened many times. Why? Because I have seen people who have quit pursuing God and started pursuing the world and the things of the world. They've given up their pursuit of God and His kingdom for the pursuit of the world and the things in it. Plain and simple, can't get around it. When people start down the wide road that leads to perdition, Satan, the devil, he furnishes them with all the excuses that they need. And they've got a, a ready bag of excuses. And they give them to us. And John said, the world competes for our love. And I want to read one of the saddest verses in the Bible to me. It comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. And that's what it talks about. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. It broke Paul's heart when one of his close friends, one of his fellow workers, one who had worked with him closely for the gospel of Jesus Christ, lost his first love, succumbed to the temptations of the world, and he left. Now Paul doesn't fill in the gaps of what happened, but he simply tells us it happened. You know, I see it happen when people start missing church. They quit reading their Bibles. They quit fellowshipping with other Christians. And instead, they began to hang around with worldly people and acting more like the world and more like the people of the world. And they also began to hang around in some unsavory places. They no longer act as children of God do. They began to talk ungodly talk. They began to they began to curse God. Take his name in vain as if it didn't matter. They show the greatest disrespect for the God who created them and who recreates them in Jesus Christ. And they show nothing but disrespect for him in the way that they talk and the way they act. And there's no getting around it. That's what it is. 
And that's what it does. It does. No longer do they act as the children of God. At first, they think they can have it both ways. You know, the president of our senior class in Bible college, he was one of four of us that went on to seminary, at least for the first year, and he allowed pornography to get a hold of him. And he began calling what was in those days the 900 numbers. And he even used a friend of his phone, and that meant that the friend had to pay the bill, and those calls were not cheap. And it was all about garbage. All about garbage. And it wasn't long before he ended up leaving seminary. But he took a church. But then he started frequenting the massage parlors. And the next thing you know, he became unfaithful to his wife. And she struggled hard for two years while he vacillated between the world and God. And we're talking about a minister here. And we all saw him when he was younger as a zealous worker for the Lord. And we don't know what in the world turned his mind and his heart and his life from the Lord. But it did. It did. John said, you can't love the world or anything in the world. Because if you do, the love of God is not in you. The love of God is not in you. Listen. The world has a strong pull on us. Even when we've been a Christian for years. You know, Satan never stops using the, world's, the world and the things in the world to draw us away from God. No matter how, many, how old you're getting, how many years you've been a Christian. And make no mistake. The world tempts us to love it. The world tempts us to love it. John points out three ways by three. <laughs> three ways by which the devil uses the world to entice us. You know, just like the fisherman uses different kinds of baits to catch fish, Satan and the world do the same thing. And the first temptation he uses, it's mentioned here, is the craving of sinful man. Satan appeals to us through our deep desires and our hidden yearnings. And John said the cravings of sinful man. That means that we have to recognize the fact of what we are. We're sinful man. We live in a fallen world and we're fallen people with sinful desires. Sinful desires. Listen, those desires are sinful. Look, just because I have the desire doesn't make it right. And if people don't quit crying to say that, I don't know what in the world we're going to do. But they do. If it feels good, it's all right. If it's what I desire, then it's got to be right. That's wrong. That's wrong. Look, you can't excuse sin just because you desire it. You can't say, hey, I was born that way, so therefore it's all right for me to murder people. I can kill anybody I want to because why? Because I have the desire to do it. I can go out and rape all the women I want to because I have the desire to do it. I can hate people just as much as I want to because I have the desire to hate them. Sin is sin. Just because you desire it, it doesn't make it right. doesn't. Listen, the devil, he didn't just tempt those people who were sinful. Do you know that? Do you realize that Satan tempted people who didn't sin? Who had never sinned? That's who he tempted. Besides us sinful people. Go back to the very beginning. Who did he tempt? Adam and Eve, they had never sinned. Never sinned. But the devil tempted them. Hey, listen, I want you to look at this fruit. What did he do? He made that fruit desirable, so they desired it. Why? Oh, it's not only good for food, but it's going to make me like God. 
Guess what? I'm going to be independent thinker. I'm going to be able to not have to rely on a creator anymore. I am not going to have to be the creature anymore. I'm going to be equal with God. I'm going to be up there. And that's what they said, what he said to them. No wonder they gave in. What a promise. And then he sprung the trap. And he basically said to him, listen, God's been lying to you because God has some ulterior motives. Do you know that God's afraid that you're going to be like him? And that's why he, won't, he doesn't want you to eat that fruit. God doesn't want you to be like him. What lies Satan gives. And they chose. They chose. They chose to be as wise as God. <laughs> Didn't work out that way, did it? They had to decide who they were going to believe. And every one of us has to decide, just about every day, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the world? And I don't care if they've got a doctorate behind their name, and I don't care if they're sociologists, psychologists, psychiatrists, or presidents, or anything else. Who are you going to believe? The world or God? You have to make the choice. You can't have your feet in both worlds. You can't. You can't. Those desires, those sinful desires, that's what Satan uses. And not only did he tempt Adam and Eve, he had the nerve to tempt Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was sinless, never sinned before, and didn't sin afterwards, and he didn't catch him, did he? Not Jesus. But he tempted him. And when did he tempt him? At the most opportune time, when he was a little bit hungry. He said, listen, don't wait on God. Don't wait on God. Take a shortcut. Just turn that stone into bread and you'll have plenty to eat. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't wait for God. Don't wait for angels to come feed you. Don't wait for that. Take a shortcut. Turn the bread, the stone into bread and eat it. Yeah. And not only this, but you know what? Listen, uh, the, you don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to go to the cross. Listen, all you have to do is bow down and worship me and I'll give it all to you. It's yours, the whole world, everything in it. It's yours. Satan tempted him. He tempted him. And he didn't stop there. He continued to tempt him all throughout his ministry. Oh, yes, let's make him king. No, not Jesus. He didn't give in to the temptations. We, on the other hand, we give in to our cravings too often. Way too often. And not only that, we also give in to lust. Lust of the things we see. When we see the world, or when we see the word lust, what do we most likely think of most of the time? We think of sex. And the world uses sex to, to tempt us into sins of all kinds. And the story of David and Bathsheba sticks out as an example of the pull of lust on sinful man. David seems to give in to it so easily. And so do many of us. We give in to it so easily. The world tries to convince us that sexual sin is, sin is the norm. In fact, to the world, there's no such thing as sexual sin. Do you realize that? To the world, there isn't. Only to God. Only to God. You see, to the world, you don't need to restrain yourself. Give in to it. To the world, <clears throat> sex no longer separates man from animals. No, man behaves like animals without any restraint. Of course, the love of the eye refers 
also to everything else that we see and that we want and we desire, not just sex. And so John warns us, listen, your eyes are going to see things that you want. And you think you've got to have it right now. Don't give in to it. He warns us. And he also mentions the tendency that we have to boast and brag. We boast about what we have. It seems that we always want more and better things than anyone else has. And we boast about our cars and our houses and everything else. We boast about our houses, our recreational vehicles. You know, everybody who's somebody has either got a BMW or Mercedes Benz. If you don't have a BMW or Mercedes Benz, you're, not a, you're a nobody. You are nobody. It's amazing. You can drive down the road and see how many toys that people are towing along for their vacation. People today take more toys on vacation with them than ever in the history of mankind. We do. It's not what we have or don't have that John's talking about. It's the fact that we brag about it. We tell everyone else, hey, did you see my new Mercedes that I just bought and parked out in the yard? Yeah. We brag. And we brag about all of our accomplishments, the things we do, and the vacations we take, and everything our children and our grandchildren do. I think maybe there might be a, a, a little clause of excuse when we brag on our grandchildren, but I'm not real sure. Maybe we can get away with that and maybe not. But the point is we brag and boast about it all the time. I don't know very many grandparents who don't have the greatest grandchildren in all the world. Yeah, I guess we do, don't we? But it says, hey, we brag about everything and we boast about it. Because that's what the world tempts us to do. You know what Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14? May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. No part in the world, we don't want it. We have to get away from it. The point is, there is nothing in this world worth bragging about. There is nothing our eyes see worth lusting after. And there is nothing in this whole wide world worth craving. John wants to make sure we understand why we shouldn't love the world and the things in it. And then he tells us why. Because in the end, the world fails. The world fails. The world and all its desires pass away. Why do you want to put your faith and your trust and your hope, your bragging and your, your lusting and everything else, your craving and things that are going to pass away and be gone? Be gone. Sometimes I think that the older I get, the more I realize that that stuff that I always wanted to have is not necessarily the stuff I need to have. I hope I get more that way. <laughs> but uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Why well, put your faith and trust in the world and the things of it? It's not going to be here very long. Why love something when in the end you're going to be left with nothing? The truth of the matter is, it's useless to attach ourselves to the world and the things of the world. Why? Because it may not, you know, it may be here today, but it may not be here tomorrow. It may not be here this afternoon. We trust in things that are passing away. And when you put your trust in things that are passing away, you have no hope. Why not put your faith and your trust in the eternal? 
Why not put your faith and your trust in God? Why not? John said, for those who do the will of God live forever. So what do you want? A bunch of this stuff for a little while? Or do you want God for eternity? I guess the choice is always ours, isn't it? And in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, it tells us about the new kingdom to come. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. And guess what? That's the place where I'll never sin again. I just think, I, I love that thought. Maybe it's because I know myself too much. But I won't embarrass myself ever again. Wow. That's a nice thought. A nice thought. So, listen, it's a matter of your eternal life. That's what we're talking about here, and that's what John's talking about, and that's why the warning, don't love the world, love God. Love God. So today for you, you've got to choose today. You've got to choose to either love God and do His will, because He's the only one with eternal life, or you can trust in the world, which is fleeting and falling away. What are you going to trust? Perhaps there's someone here today who needs to make that decision. That decision to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. To put their trust in Him for all eternity. To say no to the world and the sins of the world. Because all the garbage that we want in this world will do us nothing, no good whatsoever in the end. Decision is yours. We're going to be singing Invitation Hymn number, as soon as I find the number, 476, Whiter Than Snow. Would you like to be whiter than snow? I would. 476. Let's be standing as we sing. Why? 